So, so now let's kind of break these two uh, separate fields down. And first, what we're going to look at is the electric field. So all charges or a collection of charges are going to produce a force on other charged particles that they are near to. For example, you probably know that an electron will tend to repulse other electrons that are nearby, meaning that it's going to exert some sort of repulsive force on other electrons that are going to push them apart. And um, electrons, in contrast, would pull protons towards them. And in general, we say a repulsive force exists between light charges and attractive forces exist between unlike charges. So if I put two electrons together, they're going to push each other apart. And if I put two protons together, they're going to push each other apart. But if I put an electron and a proton together, they're going to pull towards one each other, or towards one another. And this force of attraction or repulsion is quantified by what we call Coulomb's law. And so I've got a charge, Q1, uh, it's, it's just a charge in Coulombs. I've got a charge, Q2, and the radial distance separating these two charges is, we're going to say it's R meters. It's just the distance is measured in meters, you know. These are charges, so it might be micrometers or something like that, but uh, it's a distance is the point. And Coulomb's law states that the force of either repulsion or attraction between those two charges is equal to Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. And then we have to throw in, uh, and that, that has to deal with the distance, clearly, and then the magnitudes of the two charges. But now we have to consider the space that these charges are in. You know, they could be in a vacuum. They could be inside of a copper trace or something like that. So we have to take into account the material properties. And to do that, we divide by 4 pi times the uh, permittivity of the material um, that we are in. So uh, more generally, that's written as Q1, Q2 over 4 pi times the permittivity of free space times the permittivity of uh, the relative permittivity of the material and then times r squared. Um, this is it's a force, so it's measured in uh, units of newtons. So really what we're seeing is that the force experienced by two charges is proportional to the product of the magnitudes of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Uh, the, the constant of proportionality is 1 over 4 pi epsilon, and that actually, 1 over 4 pi epsilon, it occurs a lot in physics, so you may have seen this. Uh, it is uh, called Coulomb's constant. It's given the value k, and it is 8.988 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. And this is a, this value is for a vacuum. So it doesn't work, you know, um, in copper, for example. This is only for charges, isolated charges in a vacuum. And so we can rewrite uh, Coulomb's law to say that Fe is equal to K times Q1, Q2 over R squared. And I think that's really the formula that you... you, you see most frequently. Um, and you know, the direction of these charges has to be determined by a rule for whether or not uh, it's a positive test charge. So um, the force, uh, again, is going to be negative. A negative force is repulsive and a positive force is, uh, is attractive. Now what I want you to do is imagine that instead of two charges like we have up here with Q1 and Q2, we just have one charge. How would this single charge then affect other charges that came near it? And that's the idea of a field. A field is really a map of what the force would be exerted on a test charge by the charge that we're kind of examining. So lines of electric field, therefore, by definition, emanate from plus charges and terminate on negative charges, as we're showing in these two pictures right here. And really what that is using is our convention of a positive test charge. So if I put in a little, if I were to drop in a proton right here, it's going to shoot away radially, so it's going to get pushed away. And if I were to put a positive test charge in here, it's going to get pulled in towards that, that negative charge right there. And it's going to get pulled in a straight direction, right? It's not going to curve or anything like that. So in isolated situations, um, lines of electric field emanate from all charges, they they leave positive charges, and they terminate on uh, negative charges. 
Um, and again, this just shows the effect that the field has on a positive charge or a proton. The strength of the E field that surrounds a particle can be derived from Coulomb's law. We just have to analyze the situation in which there's just one particle. And what it shows us is that the, the uh, strength of the E field measured in volts per meter is going to be K times Q. There's just one charge, so it's just one Q. I don't have to differentiate the two. And then I get R, divide that by R squared. And, uh, you know, that's, again, for a vacuum. And E, the electric field strength in volts per meter, is going to be uh, Q over 4 pi epsilon over R squared. And that's the general case right there. That's the one that will work in any situation. So let's talk a little bit more about this epsilon term right here. What is that? Because we've talked about it, but we haven't really explained it all that much. So what hap what turns it turns out that the material or the environment or whatever is surrounding a charge is going to influence the particle's ability or the electric field of the particle's ability to permeate through space. So some materials can sustain a lot of electric field and other materials for the same amount of charge can't sustain much uh, electric field strength. And we need to quantify that based on the material. And that's what that um, epsilon is. It's called the electric uh, permittivity. You may have heard it called uh, the, uh, the dielectric constant of a material, and it's written as epsilon equals epsilon zero times epsilon relative. And this is, again, epsilon is often called the dielectric constant. Um, epsilon zero is often called the permittivity of free space. More appropriately, it's the electric permittivity of free space. And epsilon r is the um, relative permittivity, electric permittivity of a material. Um, the dielectric constant is given in units of farads per meter. And the, rel the permittivity of free space is a universal constant. Epsilon zero is equal to 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. I recommend that you memorize that value for this class. You'll be using it all the time. 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Uh, permittivity of free space. Relative permittivities, um, that's really what quantifies material properties and their ability to sustain different uh, electric field strengths for a constant valued uh, charge. Um, your Appendix E of your textbook has a bunch of these listed in it. Some examples are a vacuum has a relative permittivity of 1. Uh, air has a relative electric permittivity of 1.005. Teflon, which is, you know, it's sprayed on pans and is a lot of times used as an insulator, has a uh, relative permittivity of 2.1. Glass has a rel relative uh, permittivity of 10. So you look at that and you're like, huh, farads per meter electric permittivity. I wonder if that has anything to do with capacitors. And indeed it does. The capacitor uses the electric field to store energy between its plates. In its simplest configuration, a capacitor consists of two conducting plates with overlap area A separated by a distance between the plates D. Between these two plates, we usually place a non-conductive material, meaning that the material in here has a really big a relative electric permittivity. Um, in this configuration, if I were to connect the uh, capacitor to a voltage source, what is going to happen is I'm going to get a bunch of positive charge built up on one plate, and I'm going to get a lot of negative charge built up on the other plate. And what happens then is an electric field points from one side to the other side through the um, uh, dielectric material that forms the uh, the middle of the capacitor. So in essence, what's happening is a capacitor is just an E-field storage device. It stores energy in there. If I were to get rid of this battery, what would happen is, uh, be, and I would maybe connect this to a load or something, current would flow in the opposite direction. These charges would move and recombine, and uh, 
that proves to us that there's energy storage in the electric field inside of a capacitor. So maybe you didn't know that about a capacitor. That's how it worked. But that's what it does is it stores charge up on either plates. Those plates establish an electric field. That electric field stores energy. And then if the source of charge is removed, in this case the battery, if that's removed, now I've got stored charge in the E field across the plates of a, a capacitor. If I then want to deliver that energy to a load, I can just connect up a circuit. And so it's actually how a flash camera works, very, very similar. So there are a couple equations that relate this. So if I've got, again, my voltage source V and I've got my capacitor valued C, I know that the value of the capacitor is, the total value is the uh, electric permittivity of the material times the overlap area of the plates divided by the D. So that's, that's the capacitance, right? Epsilon A over D. The total charge stored on the two plates, Q, so if I were to sum up the total amount of charge that is stored, it's the capacitance times the voltage. So it's stored charge, uh, it's coulombs. Capacitance is going to be in farads. And voltage, you know, is clearly going to be in, uh, in volts. So that tells us how much uh, uh, total stored charge there is in coulombs. And the reason we want to know that is the total energy stored in a capacitor in units of joules is equal to one half times the square of the total storage charge divided by the capacitance of the device. And now I can make a substitution for a little easier to use formula, one half CV squared is equal to the energy stored in a capacitor in the electric field. So, uh, you know, a practical example of how we use E-fields to store um, uh, energy in circuits.